early this morning, first session. Um, I really appreciate it. My name is Dr. Tiffany Wild, and I'm a professor, assistant, well, associate professor now, just made tenure, sorry. Um, yay! <laughs> um, here at The Ohio State University and the faculty lead for our program in visual impairment. And I'm Karen, Dr. Karen Taylor, and I am only an assistant professor at uh, Shawnee State University, and that's in Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, I am the uh, lead faculty for the TBI Consortium program, which is a teacher training program for TBIs. Um, it's a multi-institutional consortium. And, but I spent 27 years as a science teacher at the Ohio State School for the Blind here in Columbus. So that's why Tiffany and I actually have a long relationship, I think, you and I started working together when you were doing your dissertation. Yes, she was doing her dissertation in my classroom uh, at, Ohio, at OSSB. So we have we go back a lot of years. Yes. So a little bit of background information if you are not familiar with the, um, working with students who are blind or visually impaired. The impact of visual impairment is widely uh, recognized to be particularly significant in math and science. And this is due to the over-reliance of the use of visual teaching methods. When we teach science, and you go to a traditional methods course for any science educator, they talk about all the great videos available, um, all the great posters available that you can use in a classroom. The textbooks, think of all the pictures that are in the textbooks. Um, I have, I did my dissertation on teaching astronomy, and when you think about astronomy, and how many pictures and videos we traditionally use. Um, so <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why students, <clears throat> excuse me, struggle in science. But also, um, we have been doing some research and we have very unique misconceptions of science. And we think that's also due to the over-reliance of pictures. And I'll explain some of those misconceptions here in just a minute. There's an estimation of about 100,000 students with visual impairment in the United States, and that's K-21. However, less than 30 individuals with visual impairment earn a science and engineering doctorate on average each year, and that was from 2001 to 2009, um, and that's data from the National Science Foundation, compared to 25,600 people with a different disability. And they have just recently updated that information um, I got it last um, Friday, and I was in the middle of grant writing, so I apologize, I don't have the updated statistics. But one of the problems we have is if those traditional science teachers, they're not prepared to teach students with visual impairments in their classroom. And um, teachers of students with visual impairments do not have to take science or math methods. So there's this disconnect between the traditional content teachers and those that we are training to provide the modifications and accommodations. Um, here at Ohio State, our students do have to teach, take a science and math methods course in order to better understand, but that's not traditional. And I may be a little biased when I wrote that in the program. <laughs> so some of the misconceptions that students have are very similar to their, oh, their sighted students. So, um, when I look at misconceptions, those are the things that students bring into the classroom, their understandings. And this may be from home, it may be from books they've read, programs, wonderful internet articles that aren't always accurate, and they think they have this understanding of science. And our sighted students also have some misconceptions, such as loudness and pitch of sounds are confused with each other. Um, species coexistent ecosystems because they're compatible with needs and behaviors, they have to get along. Uh, use of personal experience to document geological time frames, so they'll say, oh yeah, I'm eight years old, that's when the Earth was born. Um, little kids, these are similar things that they talk about. Um, also that the Earth moves back and forth for seasonal change, um, we see that a lot in the literature, kind of like a windshield washer. However, some of these examples of misconceptions that students with visual impairments bring into the classroom, um, I'm going to give a couple examples. I'm going to have Dr. Kaler give a couple from her geology work that she's been doing. Um, sound is made by noise, okay? Or my, one of my favorite um, little guy, you know you're not supposed to have favorite students, but sometimes as a teacher, you kind of do sometimes. And one of the ones I 
I really loved was this little guy said that well, we were doing a, a unit on the wild turkey out in nature and right around Thanksgiving time. And I said, how big is the wild turkey? And he said, a million pounds. I said, a million pounds? Wow, how did you get that? And he says to me, well, mama said we made a big turkey. And a big number is a million. So it had to be a million pounds. And I said, wow, that's a big turkey. Um, so it was putting those concepts together that, I mean, all of us in here, we know that a turkey, wild turkey, would never weigh a million pounds. But he's putting together concepts that he's heard and trying to make sense of the world. Another one that um, we encountered uh, was one of the girl, a girl that we were working with said, that the earth recycles materials in volcanoes. And she said, so you know, like the cups and the napkins that come out of the top of volcanoes. And I was thinking, well, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, we're recycling. So if we're recycling, those materials are coming out of the volcano. So again, putting the concept of the word recycle that she had heard with the concepts we were teaching about geology. Mm -hmm. And some, some of the, uh, when I was doing my dissertation research, um, I was looking at, just the, the concept, their concept, the conceptual change as far as plate tectonics um, as it relates to uh, geologic uh, formations, um, plate tectonics related to volcanoes and earthquakes and things like that. And so not only um, many, many, many students have mis misconceptions, many teachers have misconceptions, <laughs> many university professors sometimes <laughs> even have misconceptions. The misconceptions research is extremely well documented across all aspects from except for our population <laughs> that's not in our official no way. correct so typically cited students or normally cited students have lots of misconceptions so many of the things that i found were very consistent with the misconceptions research out there there were a couple things like tiffany mentioned the recycling of materials within a volcano um, and then also the idea that tectonic plates float around on the ocean and not having that understanding of the, you know, the, the consistency of the layers of the earth and understanding how the mantle relates to the crust and, and, and so forth. And then also just the volcanoes helping to push the plates around and things like that. Um, and then also the idea of, uh, let's see, what was the other one? Um, oh, the water pressure, yeah, the idea. And this was an interesting one. So one student thought that their water pressure was related to um, the movement of the tectonic plates, and that she envisioned these plates just shooting apart from each other. And so that conception of how slow they move and the fact that they are, you know, the, the movements themselves are very, very difficult for students to understand, especially students with visual impairment. So we did find what was the interesting thing through um, some, some intense intervention across the three week time period with lots of hands on materials, and I also use some 3D printed models uh, in my research, we did, they did make conceptual change. So they did under, many, many of them, or almost all of them actually, I did it in a pilot study and in my dissertation, um, we made, they made conceptual leaps. So that was a good thing. But a lot of it just is like Tiffany was mentioning, just not having a visual reference for anything. So, you know, I can remember a student I had years ago that thought we were talking about lots of different animals in the classroom and we were talking about beavers. And I said, how, how big do you think a beaver is? Oh, I don't know. You know, and she held her hand up to a shoulder hat. No conception. Well, how would she? She was totally blind from birth. She had never seen a beaver. So the more, and I, we'll talk a little bit about that later, about the importance of having lots of models in the classroom. Again, we talked about how students with visual impairments will mix concepts from different science domains, a lot of personal experience, a lack thereof to describe science, uh, confusion of documentation with causality, limited sense of scale. This is a huge one that uh, we see over and over again, not only in science but mathematics, difficulty with scale, proportionality, and quantity. You know, how do you describe outer space if you can't see it? lack of a visual reference, and inexperience um, in applying reasoning and, and evidence. But that's our job. We've got to overcome all this. Um, so as a classroom teacher. Yeah, so um, oh, when, when 
we're talking about uh, st students with visual impairments or kids with visual impairments, the most important thing is experiential learning. So when we're talking, of, we need to we need to get them out there and interacting with, with real life as many times as possible. Um, so one of the things that we are, as a TVI, so as a teacher of the visually impaired, which I am and he is as well, um, we, it's our job, okay, to work with that classroom teacher. We are not the content experts, okay? Not necessarily, some of us are, but we are not necessarily the content experts but we need to work with that classroom teacher to make sure that that classroom is accessible, to make sure that there are adapted materials, that there's, lot, there's as many models as possible, okay? The real life thing is the best, okay? So that's number one. And, and there's limited research as far as when you talk about evidence-based practices or there are research-based practices in our field. Unfortunately, I'm trying to change that. But we know for sure, number one, Okay, is having real objects. That's the best. If you can't have the real object, then you have a model of the object. And then if you can't have a model, maybe you can have a 3D printed model, which we'll talk about later. So having the correct equipment, the adapted equipment, the models, the, the tactile graphics that are necessary, uh, which may be allowing them to have a tactile representation of that picture. Um, teaching those prerequisite skills. So there may be things that you may have to work on with the student that they, they maybe aren't up to that level. So for things like pouring, maybe that's not something they've had a lot of experience with. So you may have to teach them those kinds of skills, measuring skills, making sure they can measure. Um, there are braille measuring, lots of braille measuring devices, me measuring tape and large print. Um, you may need to communicate, you're going to be communicating, there's that constant communication with that general educator. Because again, they are the, the content expert. You are the accessibility expert. Um, and then may, maybe letting them know what kinds of misconceptions that student may have. And then um, again, uh, just participating in the classroom. I, I'll, unfortunately, in a lot of our settings, it's we have an itinerant model in the state of Ohio. So most of those TBIs are uh, maybe only in there, it depends. They might only be in there once a week. They might be in there once every two weeks, once a month. It depends on this, the amount of service. So, but the TBI role is very important in making sure that teacher understands what that student needs. And then being a part of that, that educational team and communicating accommodations, whether it's testing accommodations or accommodations in the class. So um, basically, like I talked a little bit about was having those materials ahead of time is so important for that student because if that student's in the classroom and they have to wait until after they've heard, you know, after they've done the, you know, the, the discussion or whatever to access the materials, that's not accessibility. So they need to have access ahead of time, that TVI needs to have it so they can make those accessible materials because frankly, they're not available a lot of times. So there may be a picture in the, the, the science textbook where you can't find a tactile graphic that you could either purchase, you're gonna have to make it. So those are things that they're gonna have to have. Access to maybe 3D printed models, um, that's something that we use quite a bit. Um, and then basically maybe you know helping them take notes, because that's maybe something that they're not as familiar with and they need a little bit of instruction on how, what are those listening skills that I need? Um, what are what are pieces of information aren't important enough for me to write down? That sort of thing. And I always, for me, I would always have the notes ahead of time for the student, because then they're not bogged down in taking those notes. And a lot of times we would, I would use like guided notes with students, because I think that allows them to concentrate on the discussion at hand and not worry so much about making sure that they're getting everything. Um, and then discuss any images with the student or it's, sometimes discussion is okay. You know, maybe you don't, you don't need to make a topographic for everything. So maybe just discussing what's on that picture with the student is okay. And um, yeah, seating arrangement is huge. So if the student needs to move up, they move up. If the student needs to sit in the front row, they're in the front row. So making sure that if they don't, you know, if they have other <coughs> issues, you don't want to see them by the window or in the direct sunlight. So those kinds of things and making sure that this, the teacher knows that. 
Um, just a couple, I don't want to take up too much time with this. So just another couple ideas, just making sure that you have whatever access they need. So if it's Braille, it's large print, audio. <laughs> And, and the other thing is, is if anybody has a question, just jump in. Because I, I like, I like two-way conversation. Um, okay. So one of the things I get common science questions when we, we talk to other educators, especially in science classroom, but one of the things that keeps coming up is how I teach clouds. Please never, never, never give a kid a cotton ball and say that's a cloud. Um, that will promote misconceptions from near to eternity. <laughs> There's a great NOAA website uh, for teachers, and they have an um, activity called Clouds in a Jar. And you cannot do this activity on a human day, it doesn't work. But basically what will happen is you can create a cloud in a jar. If you open it quickly and allow the student to put their hand in, they can actually feel the water droplets. The students with low vision can put the black in the background and can kind of see what's going on as well. Um, Shadows is another one that I get asked about a lot. So it used to be really easy because we could go to Radio Shack, I'm dating myself, um, to get a light sensor. Now just go on Amazon, right? Everything's on Amazon. And get a light sensor, have the student stand, and it'll beep uh, when it's in the light and then not beep when it's not. So you can physically make an outline of the shadow. What I use has been like boat rope because it's real thick. And then the students can take their foot and walk around the different shadows if you're going to do a human or if it's just an object you know you can do some yarn or um, wiki sticks or things like that to make that shadow same way with that light sensor we also get asked a lot about how you use a microscope um, right now and if you go to the APH uh, talk next you'll learn more how to use the microscope more so I'll just briefly say um, you can attach a microscope to a computer. You can project that image onto a whiteboard for a student with low vision. You can also print off the image if you take a digital snapshot, put it onto some swell form paper. So this is special paper that had capsules in it. And it'll raise, depending on how dark of a line you create. And then you put it into a machine, a swell form machine, and it'll make an instant tactile graphic. So that's one way you can use it. And I have a picture I'm so afraid to touch this computer. Mm -hmm. I have a picture of this well-formed machine um, creating one of those tactile graphics. Uh, thermodynamics, the way that I do this is with a hot and cold pack. <coughs> you can break them and have the students feel that chemical reaction happening safely. Um, astronomy, okay, this is Noreen. I, I, I worked with her at, at UCLAN and I use this all the time, so sorry. This is her idea, not mine, I'm not taking credit. Um, we attached cameras to a telescope, we took a digital image, again put it onto swell paper, ran it through the machine, and I loved it because we, I will never forget that night, I was the, the person in charge of the cords, and we had to plug into a library, and we were in this big field, and I'm running, running, running from the library with these long cords, but it was amazing, and the kids had so much fun, um, and we're working to bring the same idea um, here to OSU. The, I'm not going to show you this video, I'll tell you how to Google it, but to complete dissections and to complete chemistry and astronomy, um, again, the wonderful Noreen and I worked at um, NFB Youth Slam, and they put together several videos, and there's one of a dissection, and I can't tell you how many times they're, they're dissecting a shark. Some of the kids are under blindfolds, and it shows step by step how they're doing that dissection because the one thing that I get from teachers all the time is I am not putting a scalpel in those students' hands and I'm not putting scissors. They're not doing a dissection. They can feel everything after their lab partner. They said, oh, no, 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 that's not access. They can do it. And then I'll show the teacher the video and it's like a eureka moment. Oh, I guess they can. So we heard a lot like yesterday about not reinventing the wheel these videos have done wonders uh, for teachers and for advocacy. <coughs> Sam, I just want to say I'm uh, Greg Van Hoff and I work at APH and next door is the Kentucky School for the Blind. And I, sometimes I go over there and assist with the science classes and I did just that. Um, they were dissecting frogs, preserved frogs. And I assisted, you know, totally blind students 
with using scissors and making the H shaped mm -hmm. cut down the abdomen and all, and exposing everything. And I mean, it, it's difficult, but mm -hmm. it's doable. And there was no blood. Okay. <laughs> no one got hurt. So yeah. Yeah. I've had it's I've difficult. had lots and lots of kids that I sex over the years. Um, they loved it. I mean, that's that made them feel included because in a lot of times in their post, you know, they were new to OSSB, they would say, no, my teacher never let me do this before. So it was something that, and I've done it with totally blind kids. I, I mean, I've had, I had one scalpel incident. And that's because this, but this kid was a fisherman, he had gutted fish, he was like, but he cut himself with the scalpel, okay? <laughs> that happens, so, you know. We did off a couple of bad days, no big deal. One in how many years? Oh, 27. There you go. <laughs> so, and we dissected every single year. So it can be done. It just, you know, you just a lot of hand under hand if they're not comfortable with it. Um, sometimes my students like to wear gloves because some of them didn't really like to touch. They, they, they were okay touching, but they didn't necessarily want to get their fingers because it's kind of smelly, frankly. Um, so, it, but they can do it, absolutely. Um, sometimes I would have students dissect under a CCTV so that they could project that image a little bit better. Um, one of the things I used to do with the owl pellets, when we did owl pellet dissections, I would, some kids preferred to do that under a video, you know, video magnifier or see what they used to call CCTVs. So, yeah, absolutely. But I think there was a question in front. Yeah. So it wasn't a question, it was okay. just a uh, comment on what you said about the clouds and ways to teach mm -hmm. the clouds earlier. Is um, something I've frequently done is if you have like either a bucket or a large metal sink, um, so you don't have to worry about what the weather is that day, uh, go buy some dry ice from the oh, local yeah. grocery store. It's yeah. like Absolutely. 70 cents. Throw yeah. it in a bucket of warm water and then it'll make clouds, yeah. but that you can run your hand through. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. It's, it's even better when you add hot, soapy water. Yeah. <laughs> the kids have such a blast with that. I used to do that at Halloween. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. um, the other reason, one of the reasons why I didn't put it up there is because I had, um, I had, I had a person say, well, that's just too much of a liability for dry ice. Oh, classes, my so. goodness. You know how that goes. Yeah. But anyways, I digress. Can I say something about chemistry real quick? Because yeah. one thing that, um, and maybe it's, I don't think it's further on in the <coughs> uh, talk, but one of the things that's really important when you're doing, because I would do chemistry all the time. All, I mean, I taught chemistry, I taught physics, I taught biology at the School for the Blind, and I had very academically oriented kids. So we were doing laboratory experiences. And one of the things that's so important is number one, everything has to be labeled. The students have to be oriented to the space. They have to know where to get the supplies from. It's very important. The other thing I used to use is kind of high-sided trays because one of the things that was helpful, if there was a spill, it was contained because spill will happen. Um, the other thing, I love this piece of equipment, and I'm, you know, I'm going to shamelessly plug it because it's amazing, is the Psi Voice Access. Okay? It's by Independence Science, and it is a talking lab quest. And it is phenomenal when you're talking about doing experiments. There's a lot of experiments already built in that the students can do. It can plug into the computer. It has a periodic table on it that's accessible. It has, you can add all kinds of sensors to it. And it's completely accessible because it was developed by a blind chemist, okay? And he had experiences in his early life where he was not able to do kind of certain things. And he said, this laboratory is not accessible to me. I'm going to invent a device that will make it accessible for blind and visually impaired. So it's a shameless plug, but if you are teaching chemistry or you're in a, you know, in, you know, in a university setting, it is a phenomenal piece of equipment. I'll just so. shamelessly add to your Okay. That <laughs> I worked for them. Oh, I'm that's sorry. right. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. I mean, actually, I'm not sorry. <laughs> I can find it. Out. <laughs> so great. But it is, it is wonderful. It is the best thing that, I, as as a, a teacher for years and years and years, it was literally the best thing to come down. We just released. Other than too. Oh yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. 
So now it has high contrast and uh, saltification and stuff. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> and I have it in my bag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 you want to see it. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I have spent a little bit of time doing is looking at um, three, use, the use of 3D printed models um, with students with visual impairments. And one of the things that I was interested in is not only would it give kids access to visual materials, but would it also help them understand those concepts better? So what would it do for conceptual change? So for, unfortunately, um, I was doing the research, but then I left the classroom, so I'm no longer in the classroom, but I'm still, try, I'm still trying to fit in the research. My university is not necessarily a, we're not an R1, we're a we're teaching first. So, um, if I can squeeze in a little research, it's always a good thing. So I'd like to, I'm hoping to continue down that line because what I was mostly finding, and others were finding as well, is that it's definitely a great instructional tool, but it's not necessarily always changing their conceptual understanding. And a lot of that, I think, also has to do with the complexity of the subject matter. So if you're talking about plate tectonics, Obviously, that's such a complex idea, and it's very difficult for many people to understand. We may not see the conceptual leaps that we might see if we were looking at some other type of concept. So, but I did feel like there were, there were, there was some information that students did glean from exploring the, tac, the, the uh, 3D printed model versus using a tactile graphic. And I have done some, Tiffany and I have done some publishing on it. Um, so, yes, yes. Um, I was just going to bolster your remark okay. about that because we're doing 3D printing of the whole data. Okay. And I just wanted to share with you, yeah. I mean, we do it for uh, individuals who have visual impairment and blind, uh -huh. but we've also found that, you know, other individuals appreciate it. Absolutely. And I, but I will share, the galaxies that we do are from a team that's looking at the 50 nearby galaxies. Mm -hmm. The first time I took the print to the team, this is the science team that knows all about those mm -hmm. galaxies, and I gave them the galaxies, and they were like, oh, that's what it looks like? Yeah, so, right. <laughs> if a student or a researcher working on the object, a 3D printing can help you. So I saw the little, tiny little conceptual yeah. leap, even yeah. with the Sure, sure. In the method of analysis, we use a fairly robust conceptual change model um, for our analysis piece. And we, def like I said, we definitely saw some change over time, but not necessarily. And again, it was a, a small period of time. So if you would use more models over longer periods of time, you may have seen a bigger difference between the students that use the tactile graphic and the students that use the 3D printed models. We have some new research coming out too of a project and we saw exactly the same thing. That it was just that it was a tool in the toolbox that we could use, but it's not the the way that we, when it first came to our field, it was like, this is gonna change everything. Every kid can learn everything now because it's 3D printed. You know, there's still some misconceptions just from the 3D printed material itself mm -hmm. that kids can get wrong information um, we also had some issues with tactile defensiveness with some of the braille mm -hmm. that was printed mm -hmm. on. It can get a little rough. Um, so some things that need to be worked out, but it's a great tool. And I think the one thing that I, one of our colleagues who's been in the field a long, long time, and we were, we were, I, we were doing a presentation and she said, I just don't want this to be plastic free. And I thought that absolutely, because for people who are visually impaired and blind, Again, real objects. Don't give them a plastic apple. Don't give them a 3D printed apple. Give them the real apple. Okay, and that is that's so important. And I can't. I just thought that was that, that's my motto. So it's it a great clue. I think we can go through quickly. Yeah. I don't want to get into your presentation too much, Karen. Right. But, right. Um, you want me to do it? Just quickly, yeah. the printer costs are getting more affordable, and there's a lot of easy access print images out there online. Yeah. Um, one, one new one is mini, um, My Mini Factory. Mm -hmm. Some really great 3D prints out there on My Mini Factory. Really great on Thingiverse too, but I really like this new one. So the way that it's been used in the classroom, yeah. um, you can manipulate the objects, it aids in understanding, can be used as an assessment tool, and I'll let you explain that. 
Um, again, it's a tool. Yeah, so one of the things that you could potentially do with the, the so one of the, and this is a really, this was off of Thingiverse, so it's a, basically I used it in my dissertation research and it's a model of the layers of the earth, just the four main layers. And I was able to hand this to the student ahead of time, what, what do you think this is, okay? Most of them have no clue. So it's basically a series of concentric kind of circles, this is like a half size. Um, and I can pass it around, or you can come up and look at the But it's, um, so I would hand it to them at the end and say, what, what does this mean to you? And they would be able to say, oh yeah, there's the layers of the earth, okay, there's the crust, there's the mantle, there's the outer core, there's the inner core. Well, what, how do they interact with each other? So I was able to use this model to help for, for them to explain to me how those layers interact with each other in relative sizes of the layers as well. She made a model of the pictures up here. Do you want to explain? What There's a virus model up there, which was really helpful because having, a, you know, many kids don't understand what a virus looks like, or I mean, there's many of them, but that's just one example. And then the other thing I really like is, is well, you were talking about some of the astronomy kinds of 3D printing that you can do, and lots of folks are out there making like 3D printed models of actual volcanoes. So they're basically taking the topographic maps, a very, very good 3D printed to or 3D topographic maps and creating actual volcanoes that are reminiscent and look just like, or at least smaller, but obviously, but look like the, the, the real one, the real thing. So those are, that's, that's kind of an important advancement, I think. I touched my computer again. Um, we had some slides about 3D printed models and, and yeah, I think we're about it. We're going to run out of time, but I will show you real quickly. We did do a model of um, a cell, and all of the models that we had are very static. And organelles are not static in a cell. So I worked with engineers across campus for engineering education. The image on your right is a CAD drawing, what the computer looks like when you're designing these 3D images. We wanted to have one that was to scale and it was not available anywhere out in the universe or anywhere. Um, hopefully this will be online soon because we had a grant to do this. Um, and this was an adaptation of the actual picture on the left of the cell that's typical in a textbook. Um, here's how it came out. It's just white filament um, and all the pieces were printed um, in a huge 3D printer. Um, we didn't have the we didn't have the money because we were on a, you know government money. So we actually had to spray paint by hand all the white and the colors were chosen chosen not because of what the organelle represented, um, but on this slide is a picture of what it actually looked like afterwards. And the colors were chosen to be high contrast. The students actually had confusion with some of the colors, so we had to change them on the future models that we made. And the organelle sat in ballistic gel so that students understood. That those that cytoplasm and trying to understand how static they were, um, we've done mitochondria. I'm barely touching this. I'm so. We did the uh, lipid bilayer models. Again, the CAD drawing on the left, the actual model um, on the right, and these. Uh, this is a picture of the printed 3D printed model, and what we loved about these is we left the light. Uh, it looks like a little tube so that students can understand that the liquids could go through the, the cells. They could take a pipette and squeeze it in there. Um, and next, I want to go quickly through some pictures that were provided by the National Federation of the Blind and Natalie Shaheen. And um, I'm going to explain what, this is where you have to talk back to me. I'm going to describe what field of science that you, you all in the audience are going to verbalize for our peers what you see. So first is a student who's doing forensics and analyzing a fingerprint. And what do you see on this picture? It's swell form paper. So we actually took the um, fingerprint, enlarged it, and put it in that swell form paper so that the student could feel the different um, parts of the of a uh, fingerprint and know that it's different and feel all the ridges and the circles. The next is chemistry, and you mm -hmm. talked a little bit about this. So a student is doing some chemistry. What do you notice on this picture? They're the ones in the burner, and it looks like they're pouring liquid into a glass. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. 
what makes this accessible for that student? The student's blind, by the way. It's on a tray. It's on a tray. Thank you. 